Hello, I'm Aaron and I have Colin and Jeff with me today and we're going to be walking you through ArcGIS field maps location tracking basics. So field operations really uh, is bringing location awareness to all phases of your field work. We have apps that let you navigate, uh, capture data, monitor, and in this case record your location tracks history. Um, it's very important to understand where people are in real time and also where they've been so that you can analyze patterns to better plan your work in the future. Location tracking is really about knowing what happens in the field. It's about sharing your location if you're a mobile user. If you're a supervisor, stakeholder, or a manager, it's about knowing where everyone is in near real time so you can make informed decisions. And if you're a GIS analyst or data scientist, it's about detecting patterns in the location tracks history so that you can make more informed decisions to improve your operational efficiency. So how can you use location tracking? So we're gonna walk through a few different examples here where we've seen tracking being used in real life situations. So first one is improve situational awareness, especially during events. So this has been probably one of the primary use cases. So we know that people are using tracker and now field maps to monitor where security, medical, and other event staff are during large scale events, such as the Rose Bowl parade. And the reason why they're using these tools is that it's very easy to deploy. It's a simple solution. Uh, there's really one button in the mobile app, which we'll show in a second. Um, the app updates your location every 30 seconds or 60 seconds. It runs in the background and the foreground, and it's relatively easy on battery life. Another example where location tracking is useful is in these near real-time assessments. So after, um, say, a hurricane or a tornado or something happened, and you need to send assessors out in the field to examine the damage, you can use location tracking to ensure that they are actually visiting the correct locations and ensuring that the locations have all been thoroughly inspected. So the advantages uh, in this scenario really are that uh, many times after these damage uh, or these events occur, there's no connectivity. But luckily, tracker and field maps both work offline by default. And when you come online, those tracks will sync. All of the tracks are stored in a single service, and we have a, a view model that lets you create views based on that service. So this allows all the tracks to be stored in one location, which makes it easier to manage. Tracks can be displayed in other apps. Um, if you're using tracker or in field maps, you can actually display the tracks on any map that you have access to. And finally, the big win here is that there's no GPS required. It's really just your smartphone. Another common use case is proof of work. So many organizations might do pipeline inspections and they want their inspectors to be a certain distance away and maybe even walk at a certain speed. You can use this location tracking data to ensure that those requirements are being met and have your inspectors go back out to reevaluate areas where that criteria is not uh, sufficiently met. You can do that by taking advantage of the location timestamp data. So every point that's recorded has a timestamp and every point that's recorded has a user that's associated with it. So you know who was at location at any time. Another example where location tracking is useful is in examining level of service commitments. When hiring contractors or even overseeing staff, there's a common understanding of the service the field worker is committed to performing. However, there might not be a way to quantify that commitment, but if you have the historical locations of all of your workforce, you can actually validate that level of service that you are paying for. In one example, uh, an organization had a contract where the contractors were supposed to have a 95% level of service commitment, but after using uh, location data, they were able to actually show that it was only being satisfied at 62%. That's a significant difference, and that's just one example where location tracking data uh, can be helpful for your organization. So there's three main components for location tracking. There's the field maps and the tracker mobile apps, which are supported on iOS and Android. 
and they allow you to have a simple experience to start and stop tracking, support offline use, and they're relatively good on battery life. It's important to note that if you want to use location tracking, it does require a premium add-on ArcGIS tracker license. The second main component is the Track Viewer web app. This allows you to display and manage users and their location history. You can see users that you have access to. So if you supervise three different people, you might only have access to view their, those three people's tracks, even though there might be 100 people being tracked. And finally, this is an organizational capability. So an organization needs to enable location tracking for their organization. It's a single service for storing and managing location tracks, and privacy and security controls are enforced by default because this is a managed service. One other thing that I want to make clear uh, is that in late 2020, our team decided to deprecate Tracker. We made this decision so that we can really focus all of our development development efforts on the new ArcGIS Field Maps app moving forward. So Tracker will be deprecated at the end of 2021. And as you may know, Collector, Explorer, and Tracker functionality has already been brought into Field Maps. So there might be some considerations for how you want to migrate. So here's some important things to know. One, Tracker supported ArcGIS Enterprise 10.7 or higher. Luckily, ArcGIS Field Maps supports Enterprise 10.6.1 or higher, so there should not be any issues if you're using an older version of ArcGIS Enterprise. ArcGIS Field Maps also has parity with almost all of the functionality that existed in Tracker, with a couple minor exclusions around how scheduling works. As far as viewing tracks, you will use the same Track Viewer web application that you use today. That web app is not going away at this time. And finally, there's some new features in ArcGIS Field Maps around location tracking. So one is when you start tracking, you can actually specify a duration so that tracking will stop automatically after that time expires. The second major feature is that you can view your tracks on any other map that you have access to. This is a major win for many organizations. Now I'm going to turn it over to Colin, who's going to walk us through the Field Maps mobile app. Thank you, Aaron. I will be talking about how to use tracking in the Field Maps mobile app, some more advanced methods of starting and stopping tracking, and also how to use the Track Viewer web app to view your tracks. So, what are some requirements to use tracking in Field Maps? There are a few things to note. First, for anyone to do any tracking within your organization, it must be enabled for tracking, which is toggled in the organization settings under Organization Extensions. You'll see in the screenshot here that I have in the slide that tracking is enabled on this organization. For individual users to have access to tracking in the app, they must be members of your organization. They also must have the privilege to view content shared within their organization. And finally, they must have a license for ArcGIS Tracker. This license is an add-on that's available for all user types. So some basics about how tracking works. You can track anywhere, with or without a connection, as tracks are stored locally on your device. Tracking also works in the background, so the device doesn't have to be open on your screen at all times. You can start tracking at your own convenience and set a timer for when tracking will turn off itself. With tracking on, a breadcrumb of tracks follows your location and can be displayed in the maps or in web maps online. Tracks are automatically uploaded to your organization's location tracking service when the device is connected. And just something to note, the tracks database is cleared on sign out for each user, so if you're switching between multiple accounts for one reason or another, you should keep this in mind. And now I do want to jump straight into a demo going over some basics about tracking in field maps. Here I have the field maps app open on an iOS device. You see the My Tracks card is listed under the On Device section, indicating that my user account is licensed for tracking. You can toggle tracking on from this location. Once you toggle on, 
you get an option to select a tracking duration. There are options for 4, 8, and 12 hours, or until you switch off tracking manually. I'm going to select 8 hours, and you'll notice that the subtext updates to indicate when tracking will turn off. We can tap on the MyTracks map card to open the MyTracks map. This map is used to display your tracks stored on the device currently. You'll see in the GPS banner at the top of the device that tracking is currently on, indicated by the tracker symbol. If you tap on the GPS banner, you can see that here it confirmed that tracking is on as well. It also displays the time at which tracking will be turned off, and you can toggle tracking from here as well. I'm going to leave tracking on and close the GPS details panel. At this point, I'm going to start collecting some tracks to show you guys how it works. Let's fast forward this to get through this a little quicker. As you see, I start walking. A blue line starts drawing following my current location. If I minimize the app and continue walking and bring the bat app back to the foreground, we'll see that it had collected tracks while I had the app minimized. And back in the app, we see the tracks continue to draw as I walk back in the other direction. I will now minimize the app and take a drive. Back from my drive, let's look back in the My Tracks map. You'll see right away that there are two different shades of lines being drawn within the map now. Previously, the light blue, which indicated I was walking, and now the darker blue, which indicated I was driving. Field Maps displays the two different shades based on the activity. If you zoom in closer and tap on a track line, you will see some more attributes about that track point, including the coordinates, altitude, activity and speed, and horizontal and vertical accuracy. You'll see for this example, I was driving 30 miles per hour at this point. We can close out of this track point now. You'll also notice on the map, arrows indicating the direction of travel. Now, let's open up another map and display the track lines there. Within field maps, you have the ability to not just display your tracks within the My Tracks map, but also within any other map. Within other maps, the My Tracks layer is not on by default. You must use the Layers tool to toggle it on. Once you toggle on the My Tracks layer, it'll display alongside the other layers in your map. If we open up the Layers tool again, we'll see that there are some additional options for defining a time span. This will filter the tracks based on when they were collected. By tapping on the last 48 hours, you'll see some additional tracks start to draw on the map. There's also an option for toggling on and off smart rendering. I'll switch it back to just today's tracks. I'm now going to toggle off tracking from the GPS details menu. Once I've toggled this off, you'll notice that the tracking symbol is no longer displayed in the GPS banner. If I return to the map screen, you will see that my tracking status is reflected off here as well. Now let's take a look at some tracking specific logs. Logging is accessed from your profile menu. Once you tap on your profile, tap on troubleshooting. You may need to turn on logging beforehand, but I already have some logs collected here, so let's view them. There are logs for other functionality, but we're going to focus on the tracking ones here. You, there are logs collected for when tracking is started, stopped, when your last known location is updated, and when tracks are uploaded to the server. You can tap on an individual log record to share it. You can also do this with the entire set of logs from the top right hand corner. Share it using a message, mail, slack, etc. Logging can certainly add some additional value when troubleshooting issues you may come across with your tracking. Now let's recap some of the basics that I showed you within the app. There are two ways to toggle tracking on and off. 
One of them is from the MyTrax card listed in the map list, and the other one is from the GPS details panel within any map. From the map list, the MyTrax card is listed within the On Device section. If it is currently open, it may be listed under the current section. You can view and toggle the state of tracking and optionally set a duration to track. Use the MyTracks map for a quick and easy viewing of your tracks currently stored on your device. Again, you can do the same thing from the GPS details panel, set tracking to on or off, and also set a tracking duration. Also, take note of the tracking icon in the GPS details banner. This will tell you quickly if tracking is on or off. And also, don't forget you can view tracks in any map by toggling on the MyTracks layer. It is not displayed by default in other maps. It is, however, displayed by default in the MyTracks map. And one quick troubleshooting thing to note is that the MyTracks card and the tracking toggle are only visible if the user is properly licensed. If they don't have a tracker license, you will not see the MyTracks map. So what about track lines and their display? Track lines can be displayed within any map. The, activity, uh, the current activity determines the color of the track line. So they may be light blue for walking or dark blue for driving. A chevron arrow on the line indicate the direction of travel. You can filter relevant tracks by the time span and tap on a track line to review additional metadata for the nearest track point. We also took a look at logging. Logging specific tracking notes for when tracking is toggled on or off, when you have a last known location update, when tracks have been uploaded successfully or failed, clearing of uploaded tracks, and also URL scheme parameter details. Now I'd like to jump into another demo showing some more advanced tracking methods. These methods include MDMs, the URL scheme, and the assistant in Google. I am going to use TestDPC for this demonstration of an MDM. There are many others out there. The tracking specific parameters that you can modify are the upload frequency of your last known location and the upload frequency of your tracks. If I modify this here, you'll see the parameter is tracking upload LKL frequency. I have set this to a value of 10 seconds. The default in the app is 60 seconds. For the track frequency, I have set this to a value of 60 seconds. The default in the app is 10 minutes. This means that whenever the app is used, it will use these new values and upload at those frequencies. Now that that configuration is set, let's do some tracking and see how this is reflected in the logs. This time, I'm going to start tracking via a URL. We're going to use a QR code scanner to scan the QR code from directly within my presentation. This particular app gives us a preview of the link. You'll see that it is calling the Field Maps app, reference context is track, and we're turning tracking on and giving a duration of 120 hours. I'll go over this in a little bit more detail later on. Once we follow this link, we'll see that Field Maps is opened and we are prompted to start tracking. If I tap OK, we'll see that tracking is toggled on and the duration that we inputted is also shown there. You'll see that this is five days out as I set 120 hours as the parameter. This gives you an opportunity to set durations that are not built within the UI. Now that we have set some unique MDM parameters and done some tracking on this device, let's take a look at the troubleshooting logs again. You'll see that the last known location is now showing up every 10 seconds as we defined. If we do some scrolling, we'll also see that our tracks are being uploaded every minute as well. These MDM settings can be very beneficial to organizations that need that finer detail. Now let's take a look at how you can use the Google Assistant to quickly and easily toggle on and off tracking. I have a couple routines that I have saved to the home screen here. I will tap on the Track Me one. This will launch Field Maps and start tracking. 
I have set the same parameters from the QR code before, which will set it to track, track me for 120 hours. Minimizing that, let's follow the stop me link as well. As you'll see, this opens up field maps and, and tells you the tracking is going to be toggled off. So how did I do that? Let's go into the settings app for Android and navigate to the routines section. Under routines, you can create shortcuts based on a URL. You'll see here's my track me routine. It is set to start when I tell the assistant to track me, and what it will do is open field maps and start tracking for 120 hours. Jumping back into the slides, let's recap what I talked about in the demo. I will also expand on some further advanced tracking methods. The first thing we talked about was MDM configurations. This is where you can devi define custom values for tracking specific parameters. Those two parameters control the upload frequency of the tracks in the last known location. I set those down to 10 seconds for last known location and 60 seconds for tracks, for an example. These will override the defaults used within the app, and the units are in seconds, as I mentioned. I also showed how you can use the URL scheme to launch ArcGIS field maps and start tracking. In my example, I used the QR code to the right. With ArcGIS field maps, we have added the reference context of track to the URL scheme. You will use this when toggling on tracking. This also comes with two new parameters for setting tracking. Tracking on, which is set to true for toggling tracking on, or false for toggling tracking off. You can also pass in a duration optionally. This is in hours. In my example, I use 120 hours, or 5 days. I also went over more ways that you can start and stop tracking. You can use custom intents built into the Google Assistant by saying, OK Google, open ArcGIS field maps and start tracking. You can also pass a duration with that as well. What I demoed was how you can set a custom command using a routine within Google. This allows me to set a custom phrase and start tracking. If you're using iOS devices, you can follow a very similar workflow using iOS shortcuts. I have an example in this slide of a shortcut set up on an iOS device. Something to note is that support for automations using iOS shortcuts is on the roadmap. ArcGIS Field Maps also comes with an Apple Watch companion app. From this companion app, you can toggle tracking on and off and set a tra tracking duration. The tracking state is synced between the, your watch and your phone. The companion app also supports a wide range of complications which allow you to view the current status of tracking directly from the watch face. Now I'd like to jump into a demo of the Track Viewer web app. This is where you can view your organization's tracks. Here I am at our organization's homepage. To launch the Track Viewer web app, use the app launcher in the top right hand corner near your username. From this list of apps, find the Track Viewer app. Mine here is on the third row. Clicking that will launch the Track Viewer app. Here you have a list of existing track views. You may or may not have some here. For this demo, let's create a new view in the top right hand corner. Once you click Create View, you'll be prompted to give your new view a name. And Create View. It'll take a moment to generate your track view. Once ready, the next screen will give you some configuration options. First, who would you like to track with this view? Let's add some mobile users. I'm going to add Aaron, 
I'll add myself. I'll add Jeff. And let's add our default publisher role. Click Add to add them to this view. We will now be viewing all four of these users' tracks within this track view. Optionally, you can select some additional track viewers. These will be the users that have permission to view this view. I'm going to add myself. And then let's open up this new track view. This will open your track view in a new map view. I'm going to check on my own user and click on him to zoom into his tracks. You might recognize these tracks from a previous demo. I'm going to change the base map just to get a little bit of a clearer view. I prefer the dark mode. If you zoom in and hover over the tracks, you'll see that there are arrows indicating the direction of travel for this user. If you click on one of the tracks, you can get some additional information as well. This is similar to what we showed in the mobile app as well. You can click Next or Previous to move through the track points in order and view their details. Let's close out of that and zoom out. I'm going to add another user to this view. If I check on the Nitro Publisher, you'll see that their track lines display with mine. You will also notice that both of our images display on the map. If you click on one of the images, that will give you details about that user's last known location. The TrackViewer web app also allows you to set filters. I'm going to turn off the Nitro Publisher user for now. From the left hand panel you have a few options for filters. Let's check out the activity one first. You will see this is, allows you to filter by activity. If you check on driving, you'll notice that the lines are displayed in a heavier shade for those that are driving, and others are lighter. You can also filter by speed, by accuracy, and by the time span. Now that we have demoed the Track Viewer app, let's see what else you can do with your location tracking layers and views. From the content page, find the location tracking folder. This contains all your views. Let's click on the one we just created. This will open up the item details page for this view. Here you can do many things, but let's look at the data first. Here you can view the data for the tracks layer and the location and the last known location. Back at the overview, we can open up this layer in the map viewer. You'll see the, the green person icon displays the last known locations by default, and the green arrows are the track points. There's certainly more you can do to symbolize and analyze this data that Aaron will be covering later. For now, let's jump back into the slides. To recap, we went over the simplest way to view your organization's tracks using the Track Viewer web app. This is the same web app that was used by ArcGIS Tracker. We are now using it with ArcGIS Field Maps as well to view the tracks from both apps. The Track Viewer app allows you to create track views, define which users' tracks are included in that view, and also define who can view those tracks. Mobile workers can only view their own tracks without further permissions. That goes for the Field Maps app, but also the Track Viewer web app as well. In order to view tracks, they would need the View Location Tracks privilege the join organization groups privilege, and also the track view must be shared with them. Now I want to send it back over to Aaron to talk about analyzing tracks. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about analyzing tracks. 
So there's really three ways you can analyze tracks. First way is using ArcGIS Geoanalytics server. Second is exporting the tracks and then using ArcGIS Pro or other tools. And the third is developing custom notebooks or scripts using ArcGIS API for Python that interact with the feature service REST API. So if you're not familiar with Geoanalytics server, it's uh, an enterprise only solution. So it's an extra server that you add to your enterprise deployment. It's a, it is specifically designed for high volumes of data and it uses distributed computation powered by Apache Spark. Um, has many out of the box tools like reconstruct tracks, find dwell locations and a whole other set of tools. Uh, and there's a little screenshot here on the right that kind of covers a few of those things. So it's directly integrated into ArcGIS Pro and the Map Viewer, um, so it's very easy to use if you have these tools available to you. The second way is exporting and analyzing. So this can be used uh, primarily in ArcGIS Online, but also in Enterprise. And basically the idea is instead of directly working against the database or the feature service, you export the data and then bring it into Pro or some other tool. Um, so it's not going to be as performant as your analytics server, but it might do just fine depending on what you're trying to accomplish. And doing this actually supports more customized workflows because you're not constrained to the different geoprocessing tools that your analytics server provides. And it's important to note that this is primarily used for ArcGIS Online because there are no native analysis tools that work against the location tracking layers today. And the third uh, kind of option is the ArcGIS API for Python. So I want to just note that there is a tracker module in the ArcGIS API for Python that lets you manage location tracking. You can enable, disable, pause, you can create track views, you can query tracks, uh, and it's very useful for repeated tasks. Uh, so one example notebook that we have uh, is around identifying inspected assets. Um, you can run these notebooks on a schedule or use task manager with a script. So there's a lot of different options here. So now I'm going to do a demo, a more complicated demo that kind of really harnesses and demonstrates the power of analytics with track data. As mentioned before, there's many different ways you can analyze tracks. One of the interesting ways is if you use GeoAnalytics server and the run Python script geoprocessing tool that comes out of the box. This tool lets you execute Python using the PySpark library on the server to more efficiently uh, aggregate and run statistics. So in this example here, we're going to be doing a proximity tracing analysis. <clears throat> the goal here is to identify proximity events where two people or entities were near each other within a specified period of time and distance. Um, this this notebook is going to chain together a few different tools provided by uh, the GeoAnalytics server. And then it's also going to do some custom analysis uh, using PySpark. Full description is here. We're just going to quickly walk through this to show you one of these more complicated examples and kind of the power of analytics. <clears throat> So basically, there's a function called proximity tracing run Python script. And this is the function that's actually going to be executed on the server. So inside of this function, there's a class called proximity tracing. It has a function trace. So this is going to actually trace uh, different entities starting at a root entity. There's some helper functions to build tracks, um, find proximity events, and a whole bunch of other things. You might notice that this is Arcade. So when you run some of these uh, geo analytics tools, a lot of them use Arcade as inputs. So it's interesting to note that Arcade comes into play here too. Uh, there's a couple of different data models down here. So there's this is just used to kind of map the from identity to the to identity when two entities cross paths. If I keep scrolling down here. Uh, this is kind of the main entryway into the script that's going to run on the server. And you can see here that it's actually taking a layer that's passed in, and that layer contains a set of parameters. So this is kind of a workaround for uh, a missing feature right now that is going to be implemented in a, in a 
the newer version of GeoAnalytics Server. So basically it takes in the identity field, the search distance, the search duration, uh, the gap tolerance, and then the root ident entity. So these are the people that are uh, kind of triggering these events to start with. And then it's going to output uh, all the trace events, all the proximity events, and all of the tracks. So we're actually going to call this function uh, down here. And you can see that we take in those same parameters we just talked about and actually build up our feature set layer that we're going to pass in. So here we're passing in the script function to run the layers. So one layer for our tracks layer and one layer for the parameters that we want to use. And when we run this, it's going to execute on the server and generate some output. So I've actually run already ran this. Um, so we've connected to our portal here, specified our track view, and applied um, a filter here to only use the most accurate points and data that's after a certain date. So if we look at this data here, before we do any analysis, um, you can kind of see what's happening. So basically, the green user is driving down. They're interacting with the blue user. The blue user then drives over and interacts with uh, this user here, who then drives down here, interacts with red, and then red kind of comes all the way over to the west here. So after we run this, we can see there's a few different results here. The first result is this table. So in this case, there were a few different proximity events. There was one where Jane Doe was the original person. Then J John Jane Doe interacted with John Doe. Then John Doe interacted with John Smith, and John Smith interacted with Maria Garcia. And these three points uh, are, are shown on the map at these locations here. So finally, we could actually overlay the trace tracks to see where someone went after they uh, were in, involved in the proximity event. So the more transparent tracks represent before someone was uh, involved in a proximity event, and the darker ones represent after someone was involved in a proximity event. So in this case, the green user kind of started off, then they interact with the blue, and so you can see the blue tracks are blue on this section here, but they're actually faded out here because this was before the event. Uh, so the blue came over here, interacted with purple, and then uh, interacted with red down here. And so this is just one way that you can analyze tracks, and it's definitely more involved and uh, more developer oriented, but it just really shows the power of the ArcGIS uh, system. So I just want to wrap up um, our, our session here with some new things that we're working on right now. So we're really focused on improving visualization in other web applications, such as Map Viewer and Dashboard. So today you can view the tracks, but they're just points, or you can view them as lines, but you need to use a special Track Viewer app. And we're working to bridge that gap today. Second thing is we're working on bringing more analysis tools into ArcGIS Online that are specific for tracking and work against the location tracking feature layers directly. We're also interested in some more ways to start and stop tracking. So in the near future, you'll be able to have tracking controlled based on the map. So if your workers need to be tracked when they're doing a specific um, field data workflow, then we can make that happen. Uh, we're also doing some work in geofencing so that when someone enters or exits an area, tracking can start or stop. One of the other requests that we've gotten is the ability to tag or categorize tracks, and we're working on that too. And the last bullet there is around capturing high accuracy metadata when using third party receivers. So, thank you for attending our session. Uh, here are some additional resources to be aware of. Uh, the product page, documentation, GeoNet, the GitHub repository, and the ideas site. So again, thank you very much and enjoy the Dev Summit. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our session today. Uh, this is the live Q&A section, and we're going to take the questions that were voted um, most. Um, in the Slido uh, section and, and start to answer them. But before we do, 
uh, I want to do some introductions of the team members that are joining you today. Uh, first, my name is Jeff Shaner. I'm the product lead for the field apps team, and I'm moderating the questions today. Uh, second, uh, I'll introduce you to Aaron Pulver, and then uh, Aaron, you can pass it to Colin. Yeah, so um, I'm Aaron. I'm the product owner for ArcGIS Tracker. Um, I work on field maps as well, um, mostly on tracking and smart forms initiatives. And I'll pass it over to Colin. Thanks, Aaron and Jeff. Uh, my name is Colin Lawrence. I am a product engineer on the field maps team. Previously worked on Collector as well. And uh, yeah, happy to be helping you guys out with some questions. And back to you, Jeff. All right. Well, we've got an all-star lineup here. Um, so let's jump into the first question. And I'm going to ask this one to Aaron. Um, the question from this person named Anonymous. I don't know this anonymous person always seems to be asking questions in our sessions. Um, but uh, Tracker was released in 2019 and deprecated in 2021. Seems like a very short life cycle. Same with Collector Aurora. What brought about this sudden deprecation? Very starting it off with a very controversial question there. Over to you, Aaron. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so we've always kind of taken, well, in the past, we've taken an approach where we build capabilities into specific apps. For example, a collection would be built into a collector. Um, work, work management was built into workforce. Tracking was built into tracker. Uh, and that worked well for a while, but over time, um, it's became really difficult to kind of scale our team across those various apps. Uh, and so while they were those apps were successful, um, we kind of came to the realization that if we want to continue to push out new features at a high pace, um, we really need to consolidate our efforts. And so we kind of made that decision um, in early 2020 that we want to really just focus on field maps. And so we decided to bring the capabilities from Collector, from Explore and Tracker all into field maps in the initial phase. And then there's additional phases to bring workforce in and then eventually Navigator. Um, so the real driving factor is so that we can deliver more features to you guys at a higher velocity. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to take a question a little bit about what deprecation means, but let's hold on that one for now. Um, we can dive into it a little bit later. Um, the second question, and it just popped up near the top as well, um, also for you, Aaron, uh, would it be possible to track assets without a phone's GPS, for example, tracking trucks or equipment such as LiDAR scanners? Um, yeah, this is a good question. So. Uh, when we refer to location tracking in, in this context, we're really referring to tracking people out in the field. Uh, so as far as like using field maps or tracker to track assets, it's not really the, um, the target goal for us. That said, there are other areas of ArcGIS that can support those types of things. Um, in general, you, you probably want to use some sort of GPS, whether that's a phone or dedicated device. And there's products like GeoEvent or GeoEvent for server and uh, ArcGIS Velocity for the SaaS solution that can help integrate those other sensor data into your your system. Um, cool. Hey, I'm going to give you a break, and I'm going to take lower in the list so we get Colin talking too. Um, Colin, uh, there's a question from Steve here asking, uh, spot device, uh, location tracker does not require, uh, the user to do anything, but turn it on. Ideally we'd want to view locations and web maps of all of our fleet, but that seems to require that our end users remember to open up the app and turn on tracking. Is there a way to default enable tracking? Okay. Good, good question. Um, so some of you who use Tracker may have remembered the, the scheduling functionality we have there. We did not bring that over to, to field maps. Um, however, I discussed some, some things in the presentation uh, about you can use the, the URL scheme. Uh, so uh, to simplify uh, the methods of, of starting tracking for your users by, by just simply using a URL or a QR code. Um, we do have some plans for uh, we also have plans for uh, supporting uh, um, tra starting tracking with uh, Google uh, Assistant scheduling and iOS Assistant. Um, 
those are, we hit some roadblocks with supporting that, um, but those are things that we're investigating to help, you know, ease um, those workflows, things that can help you start tracking in the background uh, and get going. So there are, there are things we are definitely investigating to, to help um, kind of serve that need that, that you're asking about there. Um, but right now it, it is up to the end user um, ultimately to, to turn on tracking. Um, there is, um, there's tracking durations that you can set to have tracking turn off so they don't forget to turn off tracking. Um, but turning on is ultimately uh, up to the end user at this, at this time. Awesome, thank you. Um, Passed it back over to Aaron again. This question from Meg that's up at the top. Uh, will the tracker license be available to the creator user type in the future? Uh, we did announce that with the April 13th, I'm adding into her question a little bit, um, that um, the field worker user type will um, support uh, tracking, it'll be included. Um, but uh, an additional user, uh, additional licensing, I just slaughtered a question now. Additional purchase is required for all other user types. Uh, do you wanna talk to the other user types and, and actually even just talk about the change that's coming? Yeah, we can, we can just chat about the license change in general. Um, there's quite a few questions that came up around that. Um, so I guess to start, so in the presentation that was recorded before we made this change, Jeff, Jeff just talked about. Um, so starting with the next release of ArcGIS Online, which is scheduled for next week, um, the field worker user type will include a license for location tracking. Um, we, it's going to be labeled as ArcGIS Tracker, but really that just means you have the ability to track in field maps or in Tracker, um, and in the future, even other apps, potentially. Um, the current thinking is the Tracker license is only going to be included with the field worker user type. There are some ongoing discussions around whether it will be included with, I guess, higher level user types like Creator. Uh, if you have concerns or questions about that, you should reach out to your account manager um, with specific details uh, for that. Um, kind of related to this, because we're making this change, if you use Tracker on ArcGIS Enterprise, um, if you have purchased field worker user types for Enterprise 1081 or I guess 109 and lower, um, you will be compensated with additional Tracker licenses uh, that you can assign to people when you add them back and when you add those licenses. I think that kind of covers the basics for this license change. Yeah, um, maybe I'll just ask a related question and get, get you to answer it. Um, it's not a question in the list, but for those people that haven't purchased um, ArcGIS tracker licenses previously, what is that experience gonna look like on April 13th for them? Uh, say that's uh, the administrative experience. Let's start with that. Yeah, so so it's a good question. So in ArcGIS Online, if you've previously purchased uh, ArcGIS tracker licenses and they've been assigned to various users, uh, those will continue to be assigned. Um, so if those users will happen to have the field worker user type assigned to them as well, you will have the option to remove the tracker license from them, which will actually make sense for you to use moving forward. Uh, so that's something to to be aware of if you already have existing licenses in ArcGIS Online. License, what's gonna, what's gonna happen? Yeah, so if, if your organization never had tracker licenses before, um, you will be able to uh, enable location tracking, which you wouldn't have been able to do in the past. And then any of your users that have the field worker user type can, can start tracking the field. Cool, thank you. Put you on the spot there with some additional no questions. <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna, let's see, I wanna give Colin more uh, to, to answer here. I'm gonna jump down a little bit real quick and then we'll go. Um, uh, it's kind of similar to the other ones. Uh, you know, maybe we'll just tackle these two together, Colin. Uh, do you designate the activity beforehand or does it display uh, based on speed? And then do you have to have the, app open to track? I guess those aren't the same questions, but you want to take those no. two back <laughs> yeah, to Yeah, I can answer. Yeah, I can answer both of those. Uh, yeah, certainly. those are good ones. 
So the activity, um, for those that, that didn't catch it maybe, is um, in the, the track panel. So when you tap on a track line, you'll see the activity there. It's also stored in, in the track, location tracking um, layer. That activity is populated by your uh, motion detection on your device. Um, so whatever that is sending to our app, we are reading that directly. So if you're walking, uh, it should say walking. If you're running, it'll say running. So it makes that distinction. And then driving, of course, uh, what I demoed as well. Um, that should come through as well. Uh, again, it's not perfect uh, because depending on where your device is, maybe it's in your pocket. That's going to work a little bit better in detecting that you're walking. But if it's in a in a backpack or or a bag, you, you might not get the same performance. So to, don't expect you know a perfect activity. And sometimes it'll be unknown, um, and then you'll just see that the speed that you're that you're running. So um, you can't control that. Um, um, but that's basically how how it's populated. Um, I did and, put in my request to support golfing, um, yes. but, but you know that that request hasn't been approved yet. Uh, <laughs> I would like that Aaron. One. Do you want to comment on that? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and then the how about the question? other one? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah so do you have it. to have the app open? Um, uh, no, you don't. Uh, the behavior will be a little bit different, uh, Android or iOS. On uh, so both apps can be in the background running. Um, and tracking will continue to work as it is if it, the app is open in the foreground. Um, you can close the app. So, so swipe up and force close on, on Android. Um, and we initiate the foreground service. And tracking will still be running um, as it is with the app open. On iOS, if you close the app, um, we wait until a significant location change uh, before we kick off tracking again. So say you close the app and you move, uh, you start moving. Um, I'm not sure the exact distance, but it, it's a it's a, a decent sized distance. Um, and once your phone detects that movement again, it'll initiate tracking again, and it'll continue tracking. So the app will actually open, but it won't open to the foreground um, and continue to track. So so in short, the app doesn't need to be open to to keep tracking you. Awesome. Hopefully that answers. <laughs> Two completely unrelated questions that I lumped together on you. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Um, hey, Aaron, back to you um, from the top of the list. Uh, geofencing, um, will it be available in field maps? Uh, will tracking be able to turn off if the user exits a predefined area? Also a very good question. Yep. Uh, yeah, this is one of definitely one of the highest, higher requested features. Um, so it's, it's definitely on our roadmap. There's some right now in the various runtime and SDKs to help support this effort. Um, so it's something we could expect to see maybe later this year or next year sometime. Um, there's kind of two aspects to geofencing. There's on-device geofencing, which would require this runtime support and would allow tracking start or stop based on your location, as well as do local notifications for warnings. Uh, a whole bunch of other things. And then there's also the server side, which you could do today if you have ArcGIS Velocity or GeoEvent server, if like an administrator or supervisor needs to be notified uh, when someone enters or exits an area. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty cool. And there's some new work that's happening in the ArcGIS Runtime SDK around geofencing it's going to be kind of interesting in general like even independent of tracking um for those developers that are in the crowd um that uh, want to look at it uh next one um if and i'll give this one to you as well Aaron. um it appears that tracks disappear <laughs> from the app after 72 hours and are wiped from the layer after 30. Is there an efficient way to store days work? Are there any workarounds for users wanting to see more tracks in the app? Would you need uh, to run a backup script? Man, that's like four questions right there. <laughs> and you know what? When you answer that one, I want you to take the next one too um, okay. and answer it together, which is storage credit. Uh, so maybe you can talk about storage as a part of the, you know, the yeah. whole answer. So, so we'll start with the on-device storage. Um, so we only let you view up to 72 hours worth of tracks on the device. Um, we actually store more than that if the tracks have not been uploaded yet. 
if you've been offline for more than 72 hours, remain on your device until they get uploaded. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, just online, um, yes, there's 30 days. Um, there are ways to export the tracks either through the UI, um, which you can do kind of ad hoc as needed. Um, you can export to see a recommended approach. So export to shape file specification where you might you might not actually want to. Uh, another thing related to storage, I guess, in ArcGIS Online is there's no credits. Uh, it doesn't um, to you. Granted, there's 30 day retention period. Um, and I guess kind of on enterprise um, a retention period, but that's configurable uh, up to a year, two years. It's totally custom. You can even store it in indefinitely if you have the storage capacity. Um, and there are, there are, I believe we have a script uh, on Git on a daily basis. Um, so that's our you need to do that. Um, the second question, I guess there is, what happens after trackers uh, deprecated? So it's important to think of location tracking as a capability of ArcGIS, and it's not a capability of just a single app. Um, so even though the tracker app is being deprecated, you will still have this tracking service on the back end for both enterprise and online um, that multiple apps can be storing their, their tracks into. Awesome, thank you. Put you on the spot for the next one too. A little bit surprised by this one. Um, are there plans to improve battery usage when tracking is enabled? And this person found it drained the battery pretty quickly. Can you talk a little bit about how it works internally um, and how we you know, operate to improve that or to preserve battery life? And maybe even give a couple examples of um, what we've seen from customer usage. Yeah, so I, I guess to start, like our target goal for battery life is uh, running tracker continuously throughout the day where it can last eight to 10 hours. Um, and we've seen that full events we've been a part of and we really haven't had any concerns um, in that area. There are several things that we do to already improve battery life. So one is we use the activity detection like Colin was talking about. Um, and we use that so that we only request locations from the GPS when the device is actually in motion. Um, so when your phone is just sitting on the desk, you're not actually using the GPS, and that, that saves a considerable amount, considerable amount of battery life um, because the GPS is one of the most expensive sensors on the, on the device as far as power consumption is concerned. Um, there are other ways you can kind of mitigate some aspects of battery life. So there's predefined intervals for when tracks upload and when the last location uploads and those make network requests. Um, if you need higher frequency network requests for situational awareness, that's obviously gonna have some sort of impact on your battery life. Uh, if you don't need those, uh, that, those high frequency updates, you could uh, deploy through MBM and change those settings to higher values, uh, which would re reduce the network traffic, which could improve your battery life. Um, in general, battery life is just a really tricky subject. Uh, it's highly variable based, based on the other apps that are running on your device, the age of the device, the specs of the hardware of the device. Um, that's one of the reasons we actually record the battery life and state uh, as part of the data so that you can actually track that over time um, and see how it's performing. Yeah, hey, maybe related to that, because uh, we have had a couple of uh, questions come in about it, not not in the chat here, but um, you can on iOS and Android kind of monitor battery usage of an app. Is there anything you'd like to say to people that start to do that? Because I know there's some nuances to how it reports that on the different platforms. Do you want to mention yeah. that? Yeah, so one thing to be aware of is that when you're when you're looking at the bat the reported battery percentage, in some cases it's it's not how it's not the total percentage of your battery that was used. It's the percentage of uh, like all the apps running on your phone um, 
and how much they're, they're using the battery. So like if, if you only have tracker running, for example, it might say it's using 50% of the battery because there's only one app plus the operating system running. Um, right. So that's just something to be aware of. And I think we're almost out of time. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're pretty much done. So um, I think we'll end it there. Uh, you know, I don't, yeah, there's a few other questions, but they were all pretty, pretty low voted on. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, there is the Ask the Experts area. Uh, I think these guys are going to be in there throughout the next couple of days off and on as well, but there's more members of the team present too. So if we didn't get your questions answered, then um, come join us in the Ask the Experts area. Thank you for your time today.